Hi everyone, today we have another exciting Physics 144 lecture. Today we are going into the exciting world of the second and third dimensions. So today we would like to discuss uh, the concept that we talked about last time, but talk about how that generalizes into the two-dimensional and three-dimensional worlds around us. That's important because we are three or three plus dimensional creatures. And so to describe the world, we really need the mechanics to talk about what the third dimension looks like. Fortunately, a lot of the math looks a lot like one dimensions. So the way we define our kinematics in two and three dimensions is to define it as the vector sum of the kinematics in the individual directions. So if we have an x, y, or an x, y, z component system, we consider the motion of a particle in terms of those co coordinates independently, the i, the j, and the k directions define an orthogonal set of coordinates, and the motion of the particle is moving around as a function of time in the x direction, independent from the y, and independent from the z direction. So if we do that, then we have a vector here, which we'll call r, which is the location of the particle, the position of a particle, and it's of some function of x, y, and z in up to these three dimensions. Then we can sort of think about the particle at two different points along this green trajectory curve. And so the position initially would be the vector from the origin of our coordinate system out to where the particle is at initially, then where it goes uh, and the final position on the trajectory. And then a displacement vector is just the final minus the initial in a vector sense. So that gives us this difference here, or maybe it's easier to see, it's the vector that you add to the initial uh, position to get to the final position. So following a one-dimensional case, we consider uh, the average velocity here to just be the change in displacement over some finite interval of time, and then we consider what happens uh, independently in each of the coordinates. And so the average velocity vector is just the component-wise sum of the velocity vectors in the x, the y, and the z direction. So basically the uh, directions in a, or the velocities in a Cartesian coordinate system, which is the orthogonal x, y, z, coordinate system. Uh, they behave independently and we can just create, treat each dimension uh, as separate from the others. Um, then we can consider the limit as the time interval goes to zero. And so we consider what happens when uh, we sort of shrink that down and calculate the instantaneous velocity. And kind of graphically what that happens is it looks like our final position gets closer and closer and closer to our initial uh, position, and we come up with a velocity vector in the limit that is tangent to the particle trajectory. So that means it's pointing along the trajectory at any given time. So tangent here, up here, the tangent would go off in the direction uh, here. Uh, and so that means that the velocity vector is just the component-wise time derivatives of the x, y, and z uh, components, uh, and they just, again, operate independently. So a 3D problem is just three one-dimensional problems. Now we combine everything we learned about vectors with everything we learned about kinematics, and we smoosh those two together, and that gives us a way to define speed. So speed for a particle in three dimensions is just the magnitude of the velocity vector. Uh, so we can consider that a bunch of different ways. Uh, we can consider as the square root of the velocity vector dotted with itself here, uh, or uh, that turns out to be just the Cartesian sum, vx squared plus vy squared plus v squared uh, square root. So sort of like the Pythagorean theorem, but in three dimensions. Uh, so that just gives us uh, an expression here for speed.
We'll sometimes also consider what happens when we have a particle moving along the curve, and we'll describe that curve as some trajectory s of t. And if we want to find out the motion of the particle moving along the trajectory, kind of independent of the coordinate system, we can kind of view this as a tiny little sum of steps along a curve. So differentially, this little ds is the Carti uh, or sorry, the Pythagorean theorem style sum of the little steps in the x, the y, and the z. And that's what I'm trying to show here, where a step ds from this current position is just a little step dx and a little step dy. And if we do the Pythagorean thumb, we can kind of uh, sum, we can kind of step in that direction. And that means that one way of thinking about the velocity or the speed is going to be the displacement along the trajectory divided by this little time interval, which is just the square root of vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared, kind of like what we set up here. Uh, but this does give us a kind of indication that the velocity is stepping along the trajectory. So it's in, moving the particle along the trajectory, and then we can figure out its total components in any coordinate system just by doing this uh, dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. Okay, uh, one more introductory piece, and that is the acceleration. The acceleration, much like uh, the uh, velocity, is just an extension to component-wise uh, treatment of the uh, derivatives along each direction. So we consider the limit is the velocity vector goes to zero, and that's just uh, dv dt. So I've sort of shown the initial and the final velocities of the particle along this trajectory here. Notice that they are tangent to the curve at every uh, point uh, here. And then if I consider, sort of bring them close together and ask what the difference between the final and the initial velocity is, we get the average acceleration vector. And as these two vectors come together uh, and get closer and closer together, that gives us the instantaneous uh, the, uh, acceleration. And so that gives you a relationship just like velocity, where the acceleration vector is just the x, the y, and the z components multiplied by their corresponding unit vectors, or the magnitude of the acceleration is just the square, you know, the square root of the sum of the squares of the individual components. So uh, giving you a little graphical representation of it, I could ask this question like uh, draw the velocity vectors from T2 to T3 uh, to T4 to T5. Uh, oh, yeah here and I can uh, go in here and the way the velocity vectors are is I just take the initial uh, I basically find the vector that connects the initial to the final uh, position so the velocity vectors are going to look like this this will be v3 uh, this will be v4 and then this will be uh, oh I got to do two to three that's the other one v2 and so that's going to give me my uh, three velocity vectors, v2, v3, uh, v4. And then what I really want to do is find the acceleration vector between v3 and v4. So the average acceleration uh, between these two particles is going to, or is going to be v, uh, oops, v4 minus v3. And so v4 is uh, this vector right here. And so we'll kind of draw that as an arrow. That's the v4. Uh, v3 is this vector right here. And so it would go off kind of in this direction. And that would be v3, but I want negative v3. So it's v4 minus v3. So I actually just switch the direction of it. And so this is v4. This is negative v3. And so the acceleration vector then goes from the tail of one to the tip of the next, and that is the average acceleration vector, which looks a lot like uh, you know, this diagram. And so this is an interesting case. We'll come back to it in gory detail in, I don't know, 20 slides or so. Uh, and this discusses the case of uniform uh, circular motion. That's the particle on the uh, merry-go-round going around, kind of viewed from the top. 
And this is a type of what we call circular motion. And as a particle is moving around on a circle, uh, the acceleration vector here is pointing to the center of the circle. And the other thing that's important to note is that even though it's moving at sort of a constant speed and the intervals are always the same going around, there is nonetheless an acceleration because the direction of the velocity vector has changed, not just the magnitude of the velocity vector. So there is an acceleration even if the speed, that's the magnitude of the velocity vector, does not change. Projectile motion is a special case of two-dimensional motion where we have one acceleration vector, and that is the gravity. And so it's a great introduction here. And so if I have a y-coordinate and an x-coordinate system, my acceleration vector in uh, projectile motion is always going to be pointed in the negative y direction. It's down, whatever down happens to be. With a magnitude of g, we on Earth, uh, we adopt the standard gravity of 9.81 meters per second squared. So uh, we usually adopt a coordinate system where up is in the plus y direction. You don't have to do this. Uh, and so we actually have to pay, pay attention. But in on average, we usually pick it to be uh, going upward, so gravity points down or in the negative direction, and then x is perpendicular uh, to it. So we end up with our acceleration vector looking a little uh, something like that. So uh, given we have our uh, acceleration vector uh, pointing down in the j hat direction, we can then use our one-dimensional kinematic relationship. Uh, there's no acceleration in the x direction, and so we write down our one-dimensional kinematic relationships that say the velocities in the x direction are unchanged. The velocity in the y direction is only decreased by the action of gravity. There's no other things. I can write down my, there's no acceleration term in the x direction, so my x position is given just by uh, the straightforward, you know, distance equals rate times time uh, equation. Then we get our standard one-dimensional kinematic relationship for the y direction. We also have one more kinematic relation in the y direction uh, that we can use, eliminating time from uh, these two equations we can get to here. We covered that in the last video. Uh, note that this is a complicated system of multiple equations. Uh, the thing that you actually want to pay attention to is that the time uh, is the same in both of these, and that's what connects these kind of two dimensions. And indeed, that's true of all two- and three-dimensional motion. The time is what's actually linking together all of the dimensions uh, mathematically. Okay. Uh, we often describe the particle in terms of its launch angle, which is the velocity vector measured in terms of uh, how it is inclined with respect to the horizontal. So we define this angle here. Uh, your book calls it alpha naught. I'll sometimes slip into theta ing it or something like that. It's just a name. Uh, and the velocity vector then is given in terms of the i and the j components is uh, doing the trig decomposition of this velocity vector is v cos alpha i hat plus v sine alpha j hat. Okay, so let's do a couple quick notes about uh, projectile motion here. Uh, I have a little uh, demo uh, that is coming from the physics education tutorials. Uh, here in uh, the University of Colorado. The uh, link to that is given right here. Um, and so you can uh, look up the uh, FET physics education tutorials. And we have a little uh, projectile motion demo here. Uh, we have some a little cannon. That cannon can uh, tilt back and forth. Uh, I can uh, change the speed of the cannon. And I can, uh, let's, you know, reduce it a little bit, set up all of these things, and I can then shoot things. And it splats down here. I have this turned to slow motion. I can do it as fast motion. Boom! That's the actual time it takes uh, to do this. And this particular diagram is illustrating what happens to the vectors of motion. Uh, I'll start out by showing the velocity vector. And that's kind of makes sense in terms of our two-dimensional motion. Let's see that in slow-mo. Uh, 
the velocity vector is always tangent to this trajectory curve, which is something I've said before. Makes sense. Okay. The acceleration vector is one. It points down in projectile motions. So it's constant and always changing. And the neat thing about that is I can actually look at the velocity vectors in terms of the components. And I'll look at those and you'll see that the x component never changes, but the y component of velocity is starts out positive and gets smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually turns around at the peak of the trajectory and it goes, excuse me, downward. And that is aligned with the acceleration vector. It's kind of what we would expect. The velocity vector is always being pulled in the direction of the acceleration vector. Uh, the final thing that's worth noting is that this part of it, this trajectory is independent of mass. I can fire all kinds of different objects here. Boop hit them right onto the um, platform. I can uh, look at a cannonball with a different mass. Does the same thing. I can do a, oh, I did a human. I can do a piano. Uh, all of these things end up with the exact same projectile motion as long as there's nothing like air resistance. If you turn on air resistance, things start to behave a little bit uh, differently. So what I'd like to do is to sort of go through some of the examples of the um, uh, projectile motion problems to just sort of show how these systems of equations uh, work together. So, uh, oh, sorry, these are a few points here. We said all of these, uh, the trajectory is independent of mass. The acceleration always points downward. The x component of the velocity never changes. The y component gets pulled down by acceleration and basically adds in the negative y direction. And then the velocity vector is always tangent to the trajectory. 